At least 35 are dead and hundreds injured after a gas tank explodes in northern Nigeria. A new year in a new era. The Ethiopia and Eritrea border reopens after two decades. And we take you inside the fight to stop elephant poachers in Africa's second largest national park. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. A massive gas tank explosion has killed at least 35 people and injured hundreds of others in the northern Nigerian state of Narasawa, according to the State Emergency Management Agency. Emergency management officials say the accident happened at a gas station along the major Lafia Makrudi Road linking Abuja with northern and southern Nigeria. Nigerian broadcaster Channels Television showed video of the aftermath of Monday's accident. A police spokesperson told Channels TV the tanker may have had a mechanical problem before it began rolling backwards, striking dozens of vehicles and bursting into flames. Usman Ahmed, acting director of the state emergency management agency, Recalling an eyewitness account says the truck exploded at the point of discharging gas. He also said that most of the people that died rushed to the scene to see what was going on. The body of a former United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan will lie in state at Ghana's Accra International Conference Center until Thursday's state funeral. The global statement's body was returned Monday to his native Ghana, where President Nana Akufuado received Anand's widow, Nani Maria Anand, and family at Accra's Kotoka International Airport. The Nobel laureate and first African to serve as UN Secretary General died on August the 18th in Bern, Switzerland. He was 80 years old. America is commemorating one of its most solemn days on Tuesday, marking the 17th anniversary of the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks that killed almost 3,000 people in New York, Virginia, and Pennsylvania. Just outside Washington at the Pentagon, shortly after dawn Tuesday, workers unfurled a huge American flag over a spot where a, high, a hijacked airliner flew into the building. Vice President Mike Pence is attending a memorial ceremony at the Pentagon. In New York, hundreds of survivors and family members of those killed are gathering at Ground Zero, where the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center stood before two hijacked commercial flights crashed into them and brought them down. U.S. President Donald Trump is attending a ceremony at the 9-11 Memorial in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, near where United Airlines Flight 93 crashed after passengers are believed to have taken control from al-Qaeda-affiliated terrorists who had also hijacked that plane. In an annual presidential proclamation declaration uh, declaring September 11th as a Patriot Day, Trump said the evil acts did not crush the country's spirit or its commitment to freedom. The deadliest attack on American soil since Pearl Harbor in 1944, the events of 9-11 changed America's perception of security and prompted then-President George W. Bush to declare war on terrorism and invade Afghanistan. The U.S. Department of Defense came under attack on 9-11 when American Airlines Flight 77 was hijacked and crashed into the Pentagon, killing all passengers on board the plane and 125 people working inside the, uh, that, that building. Uh, via Pentagon correspondent Kalabab spoke with one man forever impacted by the attack. She brings us this story, his story, in his own words, and takes us to the 9-11 Pentagon Memorial built to honor those lost uh, that, that fateful day that, changed, uh, that forever changed our world. My brother Dave, my younger brother, was killed in the Pentagon on 9-11. My uh, brother-in-law, who's a DC homicide cop, was able to do the building because he knew people in the FBI. Uh, and he told us that we need to prepare for the worst because um, nobody was trapped in the building. If people hadn't gotten out by then, or within the first probably four or five hours after the attack, people weren't, weren't coming out. Uh, I do this to honor my brother's memory and to honor all the people who who died here so we, we never forget them and, and remind people about uh, what happened that day. When you first walk in, that is the uh, essentially the, the zero line. So you basically come up to and it's got September 11th, 2001, uh, the time of the attack, 9.37 a.m. The first couple of benches you see and you start to figure this out, if this is 2001, 
you'll see a 1998 age marker there. You start to figure out that this was the three-year-old little girl, Dana Falkenberg, who was on the trip with her parents and who died in the plane. And you can see that her bench is pointing toward the Pentagon because when you go and read the name at the end of her bench, you'll see the sky in the background, which signifies that uh, Dana died on Flight 77. This is actually my brother Dave's bench. Uh, it's on the 1961 age line, which signifies the year that he was born. And when I read his name and look and see the Pentagon in the background, that signifies someone who died in the Pentagon and in the building. The benches are also arranged according to uh, the flight path of the plane into the building. You're kind of oriented to where the plane hit. The designers wanted a place like no other because 9-11 was like a day like no other. So uh, it, it provides that for family members and, and visitors. Well, for more on today's activities at the U.S. military headquarters just outside Washington, D.C., a viewer corresponding Kala Bab joins me live uh, from the Pentagon. Hello, Kala. Looks like... Uh, Kala? Well, uh, looks like we have some issue there. Now, going back to Africa, in a major step towards total reconciliation, uh, the leaders of Ethiopia and Eritrea on Tuesday reopened crossing points on their shared border for the first time in 20 years, cementing a stunning reconciliation and giving Addis Ababa a direct route to its former force, Red Sea port. Now, Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed said Ethiopian and Eritrean forces stationed along the border will be moved back to camps to ease tensions further. Thousands of people from both countries watched one border opening ceremony in Zalambesa, an Ethiopian border town that was reduced to rubble soon after hostilities between the neighbors started in 1998. Soldiers and uh, civilians, uh, rather Ethiopian and Eritrean flags, lined the road as Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed and Eritrean President Issa Safirwoki opened the frontier in a ceremony broadcast live in Ethiopian state TV. The two leaders opened another frontier crossing at Bure. That's according to a tweet by Eritrea's information minister, Yamani Meskel. Now, Tanzania's uh, Salus Game uh, Preserve is a massive 55,000 square kilometer, the second largest national park in Africa. It's a safari destination rich with wildlife, but also a destination for ivory poachers. Elephants in Salusi have paid a steep price, but in April 2018, the Tanzanian government, uh, with support from World Wildlife uh, Fund, launched the country's largest ever elephant col uh, collaring effort to protect its, uh, its dwindling elephant population. At least six, 60 rather, elephants are expected to be collared, which will enable reserve management and government ranges to track their movements and act against threats in real time. In part two of the poachers, viewers Idi Ligongo and Omari Kaseko traveled to Salusi to interview the impoverished uh, uh, neighbors and who are now working to fight poaching and the poachers. Salu Game Reserve, Tanzania. Awe-inspiring grandeur in one of Africa's richest wildlife areas but a deadly place to be an elephant. Poachers have slaughtered them mercilessly. In 2009, 114,000 lived here in the savannah. Five years later, only 43,000 were left. 60% of the herd gone. Uh, Mubarak Kabalika is a woodworker from Tapika village on the northeast border of the Salu. He has another job, volunteer soldier on the front lines of the poaching war. We are volunteers because we like to do this job. We are also getting some money to improve our schools and health care because these things are improving very slowly. This effort recruits locals to fight poaching. It's a partnership between the Tanzanian government and the World Wildlife Fund. WWF provides money to villagers like Tapika for community projects. In return, villagers go on the lookout for poachers. These volunteers are poor. At times when they do find poachers, 
they take money to let them go. I have been here since yesterday and I'm not sure what am I going to earn for my work. Whoever we find lurking around in the forest, we treat as criminal. And if they are willing to give us $8, $10, we should take it. Because we are usually haven't even eaten since the day before. Poachers are not far from Mubarak. In fact, they are the people he grew up with. Musa Omari Matimbwa inherited the job of poaching from his father. He explains how it works. Jumane Magembe is the former Minister of Natural Resources and Tourism. He says the Tanzanian government is fighting poaching at all levels. What we do is uh, we go for the guy who shoots, the guy who takes off the horns, the guy who transports them from the bush using motorbikes or bicycles, the guys who transfer it from the bicycles into large lots and take to town, and the baron in town who actually do, does the trade. Tanzania's poaching fight and its elephants are in a precarious time. And now, volunteers like Mubarak may have less incentive to help. The WWF recently cancelled grants to the Tapika Wildlife Area. Without more help, Mubarak says it is the elephants who will pay. You see someone who does poaching become successful, and it motivates you as well. You can become a poacher by seeing someone else's action. You see that he drives his motorcycle while you still depend on the community motorcycle to do this volunteer work. Mubarak looks into the night. This, he says, is everyone's fight. But after years of pressure from conservationists, China finally formally started a ban on ivory sales in December of 2017. It is the biggest recent development in the fight against elephant and rhinoceros poaching. But investigators say the international criminal gangs that kill for tusks and horns remain active and more dangerous than ever in Tanzania. A task force pursuing the syndicate has made some high-profile arrests, including a long-time aiding the visually impaired to navigate city streets.
What is time for our health report? And joining us now is Africa 54 Health correspondent Lino Madu with the latest on a deadly outbreak in Zimbabwe. Lino. The Zimbabwean health minister has declared a cholera emergency in the capital Harare after at least 18 people have died. Health authorities say over 2,000 people have been infected by the cholera outbreak that's being attributed to shortages of safe drinking water and poor sanitation. Tents have been erected at the Beatrice Road Infectious Diseases Hospital to cater for the growing number of patients. Cholera is caused by ingestion of contaminated food or water and can kill within hours if untreated. The UN Children's Agency says it is assisting Zimbabwe's government with hygiene and water provisions. In 2008, more than 4,000 Zimbabweans died from cholera, according to the government. Now, a six-year-old girl became Mali's first open-heart surgery patient on Monday after a successful procedure performed by a team of Malian and French surgeons, a first for the African nation. Fanta Diara was diagnosed with a heart condition when she was just a baby. She underwent the operation in what medical official hope will be the first of many such life-saving operations for Malians who previously have had to travel overseas for treatment. The United Nations Children's Fund warns that the large number of extreme weather events around the world are putting children in immediate danger and jeopardizing their futures. UNICEF says while individual weather events cannot specifically be attributed to climate change, the increasing frequency and severity of extreme weather, including recent high temperatures, intense rains and slow-moving weather fronts, are in line with predictions of how human activities are affecting the global climate. The fund says such events could cause death and devastation and could also contribute to the increased spread of major killers such as malnutrition, malaria and diarrhea. It stressed that as these extreme climate events are increasing in frequency and magnitude, and the risks to children are likely to outpace global capacity to mitigate them, as well as provide a humanitarian response. Now, a new report by the World Health Organization reveals that more than 25% of the world's adult population were insufficiently active in 2016, putting them at a greater risk for non-communicable diseases. The World Health Organization says about 1.4 billion of adults worldwide were insufficiently active in 2016. This lack of activity puts them at greater risk of cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, dementia, and some cancers, according to WHO's researchers in the first study to estimate global physical activity trends over time. So with this study, we are looking at global and regional levels and trends in insufficient physical activity. And we found that more than a quarter of the global population are insufficiently physically active but it's not equal between men and women. The WHO says in 2016, almost one in three women and one in four men worldwide were not reaching the recommended levels of physical activity needed to stay healthy. Thus, at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity physical activity per week. The new study is based on self-reported activity levels including activity at work and at home, for transport and during leisure time. It included 1.9 million participants, 18 and older, in 168 countries. Low-income groups, all low-income countries together, had a prevalence of 16% of insufficient physical activity. Middle-income groups had a prevalence of 28% and high-income groups of 37 So we see a very clear pattern here that wealthier countries tend to have higher levels of inactivity. The researchers say as countries prosper and their use of technology increases, declines in occupational and domestic physical activity are inevitable. The importance of physical activity is enormous. First and foremost, it prevents cardiovascular disease, one of the leading killers. So that's heart disease and stroke. The second area is prevention of cancer. 
Thirdly, prevention of diabetes. And all these three are major killers and, uh, and causes of premature death in today's world, in high income and in low income. But there are more benefits from physical activity. It improves mental health and well-being. In the study published in the medical journal Lancet, WHO researchers say governments must provide and maintain an infrastructure that promotes increased walking and cycling for transport and active sports and recreation. And that's our health report for today. To stay in touch, find me on Twitter at Lenore Moudou. Vincent, more time in the gym for you, right? <laughs> Back I've... to you. <laughs> Yeah, I think so. I'll, I'll do my best. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Lenore. And I'll be sure to watch Lenore's uh, Madhu's health reports every Tuesday and Thursday right here on Africa 54. Fully electrifying sub-Saharan Africa has been a daunting challenge. But along with the traditional solutions of building and running a vast nationwide electrical grid, there are new solutions for villages and other small areas. In this second segment of the Empowering Africa series, VOA senior analyst Jeffrey Young describes the options available for providing reliable electrical service across the continent. With electricity, people can tap into all of the technologies of the 21st century. Mobile phones, televisions, refrigerators, electric motors that power a workplace and create jobs for themselves and others. Sub-Saharan Africa's big cities are electrified, making them busy places night and day. But large parts of the countryside are not part of the electrical grid. The World Bank says that more than 600 million people are in the dark. The challenges facing and bridging this gap are discussed via Skype by KwaZulu Natal University analyst Gerard Boyce. In our conversations around electricity generation, we have got to start thinking more about the distribution. How do we get it to the most marginalized sectors of our society? Um, if you go to parts of Johannesburg or Cape Town, there's not much which distinguishes them from any big or growing city in the developed world. How do you do, what do you do when it's uh, a rural village out in Mpumalanga or out in Nampula province in Mozambique? The World Bank has estimated that it would take $850 billion for African governments to fully expand their electrical grids, well beyond the capabilities of most of those countries. The U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, uses its Power Africa initiative to help African states find new solutions to meet rising demand and overcome technical and financial challenges. Power Africa Deputy Director Matthew Reese. Governments of Africa, multilateral banks, this is no longer your responsibility. What we're going to do under Power Africa is try to work with the private sector to mobilize private sector investment and in capitalization of the African energy uh, infrastructure of the future. Access to electricity is opportunity, and it's the connection that's needed to plug Africa into the global economy. Reese says Power Africa has booked 90 projects to date, working with African governments to engage private sector involvement and to find ways to make electricity affordable while generating enough revenue to build and maintain the grid. Power Africa supports conventional power generation and distribution, but also supports partnerships for renewable energy projects. Those can include solar-powered mini-grids that power villages and homes on a pay-as-you-go basis and support electrified economic activity. Numerous observers say that such small projects can be effective interim solutions to beating energy needs. One of them is aid agency Oxfam energy analyst Sasanka Thalakasiri. If a community has their own self-sustained mini-grid, um, it takes away a lot of some of those connectivity issues. But of course, we need a, we need a plan for eventual grid arrival, right? Um, and this is working with the utility, trying to understand where people are situated, how can we make sure that we can tie in the grid when it comes. In the next segment of Empowering Africa, we look at conventional power generation using coal. Jeffrey Young, VOA News, Washington. 
Well, in an age where renewable energy such as solar and wind gain prominence in electrical power generation, some sub-Saharan uh, sub African countries are going in another direction, building huge coal-fired power plants. On Wednesday's Empowering Africa, viewers Jeffrey Young speaks with a number of analysts about why parts of the continent prefer coal over other sources, other resources. Now, a stuffed uh, toy monkey called Tiwa holds uh, some of Nigeria's oldest uh, folk tales and is helping to revive the traditional practice of storytelling by appealing to a younger generation. Faith Lapidus reports. In a little village, there lives a man who had two wives and two daughters, ate, slept, or visited friends. In nearly every culture around the world, Storytelling was traditionally how one generation passed knowledge to the next. But today, in our multimedia-connected world, such folk tales are rarely told. And that's where Tiwa, the wise monkey, comes in. Tiwa was created by entrepreneur Tola Akanbi, who says Nigerians are losing the oral tradition of storytelling. Nobody tells their kids, sit, sitting them down to tell them stories nowadays, but Tiwa helps to bring that back. Then also, all the stories that are on Tiwa, they teach morals, good behavior, you know, why you should not be greedy, why you should be hardworking, why you should obey your parents. So all these things are what children can benefit from. My favorite story is the fisherman and his greedy wife. There was a fish who can grant three wishes, but, but his wife wanted more. I learned that you should appreciate what you have. Tiwa tells 30 folk tales in English with songs, names, and familiar expressions in the local Yoruba language. <laughs> Tunji Sodamirin, a storyteller and theater arts lecturer at the University of Lagos, says Tiwa has the potential to cut across different cultures. What I feel is that, okay, um, this is a way of appealing to, you know, w white or black or whatever culture that you come from. This is Teddy Bear, which represents, you know, the Western tradition and the Tiwa, you know, in terms of name and the content of the story is highly indigenous of Yoruba culture, which is a good fusion. Because of the high cost of production in Nigeria, Tiwa is manufactured in China, imported to Nigeria, and then repackaged for a domestic market. Akambi hopes to produce the next batch of Tiwa storytelling dolls in Nigeria. The plan is to expand the number of Tiwa's folk stories and to include other popular languages used in Nigeria, such as Hausa, Igbo, and Yoruba. I'm Faith Lapidus, VOA News. And that's it. Thank you. Have a good night. Welcome to English in a Minute. Canaries are little yellow birds. Canary in a coal mine. Why are these cute birds in a dark coal mine? Did you hear about Sarah? The boss took her to dinner and then fired her the next day. The same thing happened to Jason. The boss took him to dinner and then fired him. Dinner with the boss? 